Well, good morning, FaithBridge family. It's great to be with you on this first Sunday as we kick off spring break. As that video was just recapping for us, we've been in a uh, three-week series on prayer and fasting, and we're rounding that out today. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you grab it? Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, if you don't own a Bible, the ushers are coming forward right now. You can raise your hand. They would be happy to give you a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, please take that Bible home as our gift to you this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. As you're turning there, we'll read from it in a moment. Uh, But I'll share with you, it was about a month ago that I was gathered with some high school students and we were talking about prayer. And as we were talking about it, we just did a simple exercise where we added up the number of minutes that we spend praying each day. And so as we did our calculation, we concluded that we pray about 15 minutes each day. Now that is not individually, that was six of us adding up all of the minutes that we pray. And I wish that I could stand before you right now and say that I was logging the majority of those minutes, but that simply is not true. In fact, as I was doing my own personal assessment, I realized on a daily basis, I'm praying for maybe five minutes. And typically that's when I'm driving to work or occasionally when a prayer request slides across my desk. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the preaching calendar that was coming up and realized I was set to close out a series on prayer. And you can imagine my dismay. In fact, I went back to that calendar. I thought, surely there is a typo here. I mean, if God was going to choose for me to preach on a subject, surely it wouldn't be prayer. I mean, we're in a series that's found uh, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 that's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in that series, Jesus talks about money, he talks about anger, he talks about lust. There's a lot of topics that God could have chosen from for me to preach about. Not prayer, surely not prayer. But here we are, and today is about prayer. And I think the reason that God is having me preach about this subject is because I'm not alone. If you were to take the same assessment If you were to look at your life and add up the number of minutes that you spend praying, I wonder if you're like me, that those minutes don't really add up to much. Or maybe if you are praying, you would confess, well, the depth of my prayer life is pretty shallow. It's the occasional request to God. It's thanking him for this blessing or that. Or maybe you were here a few weeks ago and you were here for Kyle's sermon and he outlined for us some great practical steps that we could take in prayer. And one of those was just to wake up 15 minutes earlier. If we would just wake up 15 minutes early and start our day in prayer, what a difference that would make. And so you left Sunday and you were like, I am gonna do that. And so you set your alarm 15 minutes early and then it went off on Monday morning and you said, maybe next week, let me hit that snooze button. Or maybe his other application that you took was to pray while you were driving to work. And so as you were backing out of your driveway, you heard that Sports Talk Radio was on. You thought, you know what? I'll listen to that instead of praying. Prayerlessness is alive and well. And so I've been asking myself, why? Why is it that we don't pray? Why is it that I don't pray? And as I've pondered that question, I've realized that there are three answers. The first is busyness that masks my laziness. I mean, simply put, I'm just too busy. I've got lots of things to do. I've got things to do at home. I've got responsibilities at work. I've got extracurricular activities I'm involved in. I've got friends and family I'm trying to stay in touch with. I wake up at 6 a.m., I go to bed at 10 p.m., and there's not a lot of downtime. And we don't even have kids yet. And some of you are like, well, Sully, you don't even know what's coming for you, my friend. You think you don't have time now? Just wait a few years. You know, but I I was thinking about that, about my busyness, and I realized 
truthfully, I do have time. I mean, I have time to catch up on This Is Us, and I'm all caught up on Instagram and on Facebook and even Twitter, and I don't even know if anybody's on Twitter anymore. And so truthfully, it's not busyness, it's busyness that masks my laziness. I'm lazy, and I lack discipline when it comes to prayer. And my guess is some of you could relate to that. You would say, I'm not praying, and and I might say it's busyness, but really it's just that I too am, am lacking in discipline. It's the first reason that I don't pray. The second reason I found is pride. As I look at my life, I realize that I have set it up in a way that I forget that I need God. I place my dependence on me. I place my dependence on on the resources around me, things like money in my bank account, on H-E-B and Kroger where I can get food. I place it on other people or worst of all, I place it on my cell phone. I, I was just thinking this week, What would it look like if I depended on God as much as I depend on my cell phone? I don't know about you, but I use this thing for everything. It's my alarm to wake me up in the morning. It's the way I get information like the weather and what's going on in the stock market. It's my lifeline for communication. It's how I get directions from point A to point B as I'm driving throughout Houston. I depend on this thing for everything. What would it look like if we placed our dependence on God instead of our cell phones, if when we needed direction for our lives, we asked God? What would it look like if we asked God to wake us up to the sin that's in our lives or wake us up to the world around us? Prayer is an opportunity for us to express our dependence, to put our dependence on God. But pride keeps us from praying. It's this illusion that I can make it without God. The third reason that I don't pray is because truthfully, there are times that I don't believe that God is who he says he is. And some of you can't believe a preacher just said that, so let me say it again. Truthfully, there are times that I don't believe that God is who he says he is. And the reason I know that's true about my life is because what you believe will always reveal itself in what you do. What you believe will reveal itself in what you do. Friends, I believe that Texas A&M is the greatest university in this country. And some of you agree. And and what I believe, that Texas A&M is the greatest university in the country, reveals itself in what I do, starting with what's on my right hand. Every day, I put on this Aggie ring. And if you were to catch me in the atrium, odds are you would engage me in a conversation and I would tell you about my amazing college experience. Or I might tell you about the recruiting class that Jimbo Fisher is building for our football team. Or if you were to look at our bank account, you would see that I invest heavily in A&M season football tickets. What I believe, that Texas A&M is the greatest university, reveals itself in what I do. And so if I truly believe that God is who he says he is, then I would pray. I mean, if I truly believe that God is the God of the universe, that he's the creator and the sustainer of all things, that he's the provider, the one who can meet our needs. How could I not respond by praying? And friends, I believe that Jesus knew this would be a struggle for us. I believe he knew that we might struggle to believe that God is who he says he is. And I believe that's why he wrote the words that we're gonna see here in Matthew chapter seven. So look with me at Matthew chapter seven. We'll start in verse seven. These are the words that Jesus spoke to a group of people. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks 
finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? One of the primary things Jesus is doing in this passage is he's reminding us of who God is. And the way he does it is he, he tells a story. He paints a picture of a child coming to their father and asking for bread. And, and Jesus says, notice the father is not going to give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, he's not going to give him a snake, something that's harmful for him. The child is not going to be ignored by his father. Rather, the father is going to meet the needs of the child. And as a parent, you know what this means. You know the great joy that it brings in your heart when your kids ask you for something and you're able to meet that need, especially if you have teenagers because they stop asking you for things unless it's to borrow your car. It brings you great joy when you as a parent are able to meet the needs of your child. A few weeks ago, we had an event up here called the Parent Student Night Out. It was the first time we've ever done this. Our student ministry uh, invited moms and sons to come into this room and play laser tag together. And then in center court east next door, they had fathers and daughters learning how to country western dance. They were two-stepping together. And after the laser tag and the, the dance lessons stopped, each parent had the chance to sit with their child and to read a letter that they had written to their child, a, a letter that was full of encouragement of blessing for their child. And then they were given some discussion questions just to look each other in the eye and have some intentional conversation. And my wife is the director of our student ministry, and so she was helping to host this event, but she also had the opportunity to participate in the event. You see, her father drove two and a half hours from Nacogdoches, Texas, to be her date to this event. And what is really special about his attendance is actually the backstory. You see, about a month ago, Jill called her dad and invited her, or invited him rather, to participate with her, to be her date. And he said, baby, I'm so sorry, but I've got a hunting trip scheduled for that same weekend. My father-in-law loves to hunt. But as the weeks drew closer, he called her back and said, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there at that event because, parents, as you know, you never lose the desire to meet the needs of your children. And this is the picture that God wants us to see. It's why he writes in verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I mean, my father-in-law is not perfect. He would tell you that he's a sinful man, but he knows how to meet the needs of his daughter. And so how much more does our Father in heaven know how to meet our needs? This is the God who created you. This is the God who loves you perfectly. This is the God who desires to meet your needs. But the problem is, we aren't giving him the opportunity to meet those needs because we're not asking. And so if that's you, if you're here and you're like me, you say, you know, prayer is just something I struggle with. It's not something that's really a part of my life. I want us to look now at verses seven through eight because Jesus is gonna give us a really tangible outline of how to pray. And he's gonna do that by showing us three action verbs, which are ask, seek, and knock. In verse 7, it says, ask and it will be given to you. And in essence, what Jesus is doing here is he's an extending an invitation to us. He's saying, I want you to lay your requests before God, because that's what it means to ask. The definition of the word ask is to request someone to do or give something. And when I think about what that looks like practically, I can't help but think about our kids' ministry. You see, from time to time, our director of our kids' ministry, Kelly Hickey, will 
give me some of our kids' prayer requests. These are prayer requests that were submitted last week by our children. I want to look at them together. This one says, Dear God, please help my puppy badger learn to be good. (laughs) This one says, I want to pray for my friend Anaya to begin to realize the one who can help her. She's having a hard time, and if she only knew you, Jesus, it would automatically make life that much better. Dear God, help me get good grades. When I was this person's age, that was my prayer request. (laughs) Dear God, help me be a good flower girl for my aunt in July. I have trouble remembering to be responsible. I keep losing my stuff and I blame it on my parents. But catch this, but I know it's me. (laughs) Please pray for me. That was from Isabella, if your parents are in here. (laughs) You know, I notice two things when I look at those requests. The first thing I notice is that our kids will pray for anything. They're praying for what's on their mind. Did you catch that? They're praying for their puppy badger. They're praying for their friends at school. They're praying about their homework and about being a flower girl. They're praying about the things that are on their minds and nothing is too small to bring before God. Isaiah 59.1 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Our kids believe that God is listening to their prayers. And so they're laying before him the things that are on their minds. And adults, I wanna challenge us to do the same thing. You know, over the past month, I've just been trying to do that. Just trying to lay before God the things that come to my mind. And so what that's looked like for me is I just start it as I'm leaving my house. And as I'm backing out of my driveway, I just look around at the houses around me. And I think about my neighbors who are in those houses and I just start praying for them. I start praying for my neighbor, Kristen, as she's going through nursing school exams. I start praying for my neighbor, Dave, who's recovering from back surgery. I start praying for my neighbor's kid, Alex, that he might come to know Jesus at a young age. And as I'm leaving the neighborhood, my mind just goes to work. I think about the things that are coming up in my day and I just put them before God. I say, God, would you give me wisdom? God, I need your wisdom as I lead our church in the area of finance. God, help me to to strategically be a good steward of what's coming in here. I start thinking about the phone conversations I'm gonna have at work. I say, God, would you give me your Holy Spirit? Would you put your words in my mouth to be able to be a blessing and an encouragement to these people? And about that time, I'm passing Starbucks and somebody cuts me off. And I pray, God, I don't know what's going on in their life. They're probably in a hurry to get to work. So God, would you bless them and keep them safe as they're driving? And then as I'm going throughout my day, at some point, I'm going to make it to the lunchroom and start heating up my food. And I just say, God, thank you for the gift of food. Thank you that not every piece of food tastes exactly like fish, because I don't like fish. (laughs) Thank you that there's variety. And then as I'm winding down my day and I, I get back in my car and I start heading home, I just start praying, God, would you help me to be a good husband to Jill when I get home? God, would you help me to to put the things from work aside and focus on her and her needs? And God, would you allow me not to burn dinner tonight as I cook? These are the things that are on my mind, and so I just lay them before God, trusting that I can bring anything to my heavenly Father, knowing that he's listening. It's the first thing I notice about these kids' prayers. The second thing I notice is that when they ask, they're asking with faith. They're believing that God is able, and so they're praying big prayers. I mean, think about this. These are children And listen to what they're praying for. That one child said, God, I want to pray for my friend Anaya. 
praying that she might know you, Jesus, because I know that that will make her life better. That's a big prayer for a child. Or the one who is praying about wanting to be responsible. She's confessing and repenting her sins before God. She's saying, God, help me. And I recognize that I'm putting the blame on my parents when really it's me. These are big prayers that our kids are praying. And adults, I want us to join in. I mean, think about it for just a minute. What would it look like if we started praying big prayers? What would it look like if we believed what this verse seven says, that ask and you will receive? What if we believed that God really was able to answer our requests? And so what if we prayed big things like, God, would you end human trafficking in Houston, Texas? God, would you end the racism that exists in our country? God, would you end the poverty and the injustice that's happening right here in Northwest Houston? I mean, all you have to do is drive down 1960. God, would you move in the streets of 1960 and bless those people? God, would you heal every marriage at Faith Bridge Church? Would divorce not be present at Faith Bridge? God, would you move and make the culture of Faith Bridge one where marriages and families are healed? and active in in meeting the needs of people around us? What would it look like if we started praying big prayers? And and friends, Faith Bridge is a place that historically has prayed big prayers. I was talking with the director of our Open Gates ministry. Her name is Jennifer Tish, and and Open Gates is the ministry that, that ministers to kiddos and adults with special needs. And we were talking this week, and she was telling me about when she prayed for this type of ministry, when we were just a little bitty church in a middle school. And this was years ago. This was 15, 20 years ago when we didn't have the resources. We didn't have the knowledge. We we weren't trained on how to minister to these kiddos and, and meet the needs of their families. But she was praying back then, God, would you allow Faith Bridge to be a place where every single child including those with special needs, would be welcome. And last week, we put before you an annual report. Uh, if you missed that, you can find it at faithbridge.org 2018. And in this report, one of the things that was in there is that right now, each and every Sunday, there are 69 kiddos and students who are coming here with special needs. And each of those kiddos and students represents a family. It's a family who's able to come into this room and worship without fear that they might be asked to leave this church. And we've heard stories and stories about families who have been asked to leave other places because they weren't able to to minister to those children. We had students and kiddos who were baptized that are supported by that ministry last year. We've got kiddos and students who come up here every single week supported by Open Gates who serve this church. That was a big prayer 15 years ago, and God has answered it. And so what would it mean, church, if if we would to just begin asking? Asking for God the things that are on our mind, the small things, but also the big things, laying them before him. This is the first verb that Jesus gives us. It's to ask. The second verb that Jesus is going to use to teach us to pray is the word seek. Seek. And the definition of seek is simply an attempt to find something. And when I think about that, I can't help but think about our dog, Georgia. Georgia is a mini golden doodle, and she looks like a teddy bear. What do you think? Yeah, she's precious. Uh, The picture on the far right is not photoshopped. Uh, One day, Jill and I walked out into our living room, and Georgia was reading the Bible. Uh, (laughs) Let me just say, it's really convicting if you have not read the scripture yet and your dog already is. The Lord really was working on my heart that day. Um, But one of the things I love to do with Georgia is we play a game of hide and seek. And so what that looks like is Jill takes Georgia into our bedroom and closes the door, and then I go hide somewhere in the house. And then Jill opens the bedroom door and lets Georgia out. And when that happens, Georgia doesn't, you know, walk out real slow and kind of lazy and go get to drink a water. That is not what's going on. Georgia is on a mission. 
When she comes out of that door, she is flying around the house. She is looking in every nook and cranny. She looks behind the curtains, behind the couch, in the pantry, in the guest bathroom, in the office, wherever she can go until she finds me. She is eager. And friends, that's what Jesus is wanting us to be when we seek. To seek after something means to look with purposeful intent. To to look at something with anticipation. And when Jesus says, I want you to seek, what he's talking about is, wouldn't we seek who God is? To seek what God is doing in the world. To, To seek to be a part of the things that God is doing. And what does that look like practically in prayer? I think it looks like just simply going to God and saying, God, would you reveal yourself to me? God, would you reveal more and more about your character to me right now? God, would you teach me and give me your heart for the lost and the broken that are in this world? God, in a real and powerful way, would you open my eyes to the reality of who you are? And friends, if we would pray that prayer, God will respond. He will begin to to show himself to you. And as he does, maybe it would be to pray this bold prayer. God, I am available. Here I am, send me. God, would you open up my eyes to the opportunities that exist right in front of me each and every day to share the love of Jesus with those around me? Would you help me to do that to my neighbors? Would you help me to do that to my coworker? Would you help me to do that to the waitress and the waiter who are serving me? God, would you give me the courage because I know it's gonna take courage to open up my mouth and share the love of Jesus with people. God, would you help me? I think that's what it means to seek. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says it this way. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Oh, church, that we would be those people. Would we be a people who seek God with our whole hearts? I think that's the second verb that Jesus wants us to understand. The third one is the word knock. And the definition of knock is to strike a surface noisily to attract attention. And I don't think what Jesus is calling us to is to grab a drum while we're praying and start beating it, you know, so that God notices, hey, I'm praying down here. I don't think that's what it is. I think the reason this verb is here is to signify the importance of repetition. And if we want to be people who are are people who pray, it's going to take repetition. It's going to take getting this in a rhythm. There's a pastor and an author named Rick Warren. He has one of the best uh, sellers on the nonfiction list. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. And something that Rick Warren is known for is that in his books, he breaks them into 40-day segments. He writes 40 chapters in each of his books, and they're short chapters that you could read in a quick sitting on a daily basis. And the reason he does this is because he believes it takes 40 days to establish a habit. And so he's trying to get you in the pattern of going to the Scripture. One of his books is... uh, about reading scripture, and one of them is about praying, and it's 40 days doing this to establish a rhythm. And right now, we're in this season of of church that we call Lent. These are the 40 days leading up to Easter, not including Sundays. That started on Wednesday this week, and so last Sunday, we handed out this little prayer guide. This is a, a prayer guide that gives you 40 things that you can pray over the next 40 days. Each day, something that you can pray through. If you didn't get one of these, you can grab it out at the Resource Center, or we are committed to helping you pray through these things. And so what we've done is we've put this on the FaithBridge app. And so what you can do is you can pull out your cell phone and turn on notifications on the app for this little prayer guide, and we'll send you a text or a little notification every day that says, hey, here's the thing we want you to be praying through. A little gentle reminder. And so we'd encourage you to do that, to begin praying. What we're, our hope in this is that it'd be a launching pad into more things. If you're out there and you're saying, I just don't really know what to pray when I get in those moments. Well, here's a starting place for you. Some of you are thinking right now, well, Sully, if we're being honest, it's going to take more than a push notification to hold me accountable to praying. 
I've tried that kind of thing before. Well, friends, I think the best way to be held accountable is in community. It's to gather with fellow believers, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and to pray together and to begin seeing as we ask and we seek and we knock with other people, watching as God responds to the prayers of his people. And so if that's you, I think maybe the best step that you could take today is the one that was in your bulletin. We handed out uh, these little prayer team cards. If you didn't get a bulletin as you were coming in, maybe your spouse got it for you or you snuck on by, uh, you can raise your hand right now. I want everybody to look at one of these cards together. So grab one of these if you don't have one. The ushers are coming forward. And again, these are just opportunities for us to be in prayer, to serve the church by praying, to join together with other believers and start to pray for this church and to pray for other things. And so I'm gonna tell you about just a couple of these. One of my favorites is our engine room. Many of you may not even know what that is, but that is a group of people who right now, this very second, are in another room of our church and they are praying for you. They're praying for me. They're praying that God would meet us in this place, that God would speak to us right now in a real and powerful way, that he would meet the needs of each and every one of us who are in this room. And so every Sunday during both services, we've got a group of people who gather together and they pray for us and they pray over all of the requests that come in in the prior week, all the ones that you were seeing scrolling when Kyle was leading us in prayer earlier. Another prayer team that I love is our anointing prayer team. This is a group of men and women who come up here on a weekly basis, and what they do is they just walk around our campus and pray. They walk inside of every kid's classroom, and they pray, God, would you just meet with these children this week? God, would you allow these children to come to know you at a young age? God, would you protect our children this week? And then they move on and they go up into our student ministry and they begin praying for our students and they pray, God, would you move in the lives of our students? We believe our students are kingdom difference makers. God, would you give them the courage at school? There are things that our students are dealing with that are very challenging in this world. God, would you help them to see your light in a world that is so dark? And then something that I love is they come in here every Sunday morning And they lay hands on every single chair that you're sitting in. And they pray. They say, God, I don't know who's going to be in this chair, but you do. God, would you meet that person today? God, right where they are. God, if they've never come to church before, if they've come for the hundredth time or the millionth time, God, would you speak to them in a new and fresh way? These are just a few of the prayer teams that you could join and, and be a part of. And friends, maybe that's the best thing that you could do is get where the momentum of prayer is happening. And that's on these teams. It's in community with other believers asking and seeking and knocking. The Christian life is not about perfection, it's about progress. And so my hope for us today is that we would take a step towards prayer. For some of us, it is getting on one of these teams For others of us, it's just saying, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to go through these 40 days of prayer. Whatever it is, take a step towards prayer this week. Let's go to God now in prayer. Well, God, as as we come to you right now, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see you as a good father. God, that is who you are. You are a good, good father. But Lord, I know that there are some in this room who when they think about you, the word that they would say is not good, but maybe distant or maybe distracted or maybe they feel that you're out of reach or that you're angry with them. And so, God, I just ask that you would do what only you can, and that's reveal yourself to us right now, that you would show us that you really are our good, good Father, and that you are listening to us even right now. And so, church, 
what I want to invite us to do is, is just to begin to model prayer the way that Jesus taught us today. And so I want to invite you right now to start right now and ask to lay your requests before God. Whatever things are on your mind right now, why don't you just put them before God? Maybe it's something at school. Maybe it's not at school because it's spring break and so you're thinking about that vacation. Maybe you're thinking about work. If it's a small thing, put it before God right now. Or if it's a big thing, why don't you pray a big prayer today that God would move in, in and through our church in a powerful way. I'm going to give you some time to do that right now. And now I want to invite us to move into seeking God. So right now, I just want to invite you to, to, to call out to God and say, God, would you reveal yourself to me right now? God, would you show me your heart for the lost? And as he does that, will you ask him, God, where can I be a part of helping to bring the redeeming work of Jesus to others? Ask him to put a face on your mind. Ask him to put a ministry that you can join and be a part of. Well, God, we want to be a people who ask and seek and knock. And so, God, I pray that you would help us do that this week. God, that when we leave this place, that we would start to establish a rhythm of prayer. God, help us not to forget what you've taught us today. Help us to, to start tomorrow praying over the, the topic that's on March 11th, which is marriages. God, help us to just begin there and then keep going. Help us, Lord Jesus. Amen.